Hello and welcome to Trial by Stone. I'm your host, Phil, and I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast as we talk about the Dark Crystal, of course. And uh, for those who are new to the show, uh, more just wanted to let you all know that this is uh, part two of our chat um, that Sydney and I uh, chatted to Javier Grigio Markswash who was the, uh, the co-executive producer and also uh, the writer of the, um, the episode Time to Make My Move on the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. Um, so that's all I just, just got to say that, you know, just for anyone who's new. So, um, and definitely check out our previous episode uh, if you haven't had a chance to. So, yeah, but for everyone else, um, enjoy our part two chat with Javier. When you got on involved with the show and of course you've been you know working with jeff and will and of course with both of them this was sort of like their sort of very first time working in television with running the show and of course you know you came in to really help them out with the process i mean what was that like did it all sort of really clicked on well between you three i think and there's a couple of things one of them is over the last you know five to six years of my career i have taken you know really a, a huge uh, uh a commitment into mentorship um, and to being a, a, a working writer but, and producer, but also a teacher. Um, Will and Jeff had never been in a writer's room. I know they, this, that's the, the, the language they always use. Um, and I'm somebody who had a great deal of experience with that. And look, they wrote a great pilot. They wrote a great season story. They were ready for this. They needed somebody to come in and help them, you know, with the logistics, with the, with the real meat and potato stuff of running a writer's room and setting up a script pipeline and all of that. And, you know, after, like I've been around so long, like, I mean, you just, you just, at a certain point, you kind of have to lose your ego about this, you know, and you say, look, this job, the pleasure of this job is going to be setting up these guys to succeed and making sure that somebody has their back um, because they're great. And that's what I did, you know, and, and, and I knew that I was going to get my satisfaction out of working on this show by doing that with them and by being very honest with them and by being transparent and by always, you know, being somebody that they could trust and somebody that they could that they could. And, you know, the rest of it was just a great friendship was forged, you know, like we just loved working in that writer's room. So, um, but really, but really, this was one of those jobs that I didn't come in thinking, oh, I get to put my stamp on this. This was one of those jobs where it was made abundantly clear to me that, you know, this was a garden that Jim Henson and Brian Froud planted, you know, 37 years ago. And we're just the gardeners who get to look after it for this, for this moment, you know? So the fact that I, that I got all of these things and look, it's inevitable. I'm one of the creators of the scripts. You're, you're going to get a bunch of your stuff in there anyway. You know, um, you know, one of, one of the, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, there, there's just a, a lot of, a lot of stuff in the show that I'm proud of. And I don't want to say that there are, there are some things that won't that, you know, because the executive producers rewrite the scripts, you know, the, the writers bring them in and sometimes you do changes on them and stuff. There's a couple of things in other scripts that I wound up um, doing the rewrites on that I'm also very proud of, but I don't want to um, dwell on those because I don't want to take anything away from the original writers who, you know, set me up to be able to do some other work which is just how it goes. You know, the writers bring it in, you take it a little further in and then Louis slam dunks it, you know. Even though, yeah, you have writers that sort of are credited for that specific episode, but there's always a bit of collaboration, you know, between, you know, all, all the other writers of, you know, in, involved. Yeah, break the story together. So, you know, um, one, one of the things that I was happiest to see, um, you know, in, in the final battle, especially, was that, you know, we had come up with this gag that, that there would be a flying unit, you know, that they would be bombing the Skeksis and all of that. And I remember I got to pitch that sequence to Lisa and Hallie and Blanca and Rita. And the two things I remember was that there was, there was a moment where they were like, Oh my God, they, we didn't think of that. You know, like, wow, you know, like everybody and, 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 uh, you know, and the Gelfling running on on the backs of the, you know, and taking off and then, um, you know, and, and, and getting that audible response from, from a room that you're pitching, you're not even showing them complete material or a script just from a pitch. So just, there were so many moments like that for us. Uh, Jeff and I used to take turns pitching to the Henson company. He's a, those guys are great pitchers. So, you know, we, we, we were all the voice of the show at different times. You know, I gotta tell you the thing that I, that I, um, that was incredibly satisfying was so before Netflix green lights a show, they have you do a table read of all the written episodes. Okay. And we hired a cast of people, you know, some, some people that we knew, some people that we brought in and all of that. And, but genuine, you know, like, like a genuine cast of actors to come in and read the show, all 10 episodes over two days for, for the executives. 
And the best part of that was just that the actors got so into it and some of them were crying. And then like, I, and we were like, yeah, we got him to cry when, when Orden died, didn't they? And we were so excited yeah. that, just <laughs> from the page and, you know, just stuff like that. And I, look, I think I will tell you this, my biggest contribution to the show, um, my truly my biggest contribution to the show. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, Will and Jeff didn't, didn't, they didn't think they were going to do this, but I, I, one of the first things I said talking to Will and Jeff about the show, as I said, I've worked on a lot of shows lost about parents who are, you know, mean to their children, you know, and I've worked on a lot of shows about daddy issues, you know, and I, and I, I, a lot of that. And I said, you know, what's really great. It's when you do a show where there's still drama, but the parents are actually supportive of their kids. Um, because I'm just, I'm tired of writing, um, you know, poisonous, dysfunctional interfamilial dynamics. They're not, they're not fun. I mean, it's, it's like we, so, you know, I mean, I, famously I called my first episode, my second episode of lost all the best cowboys have daddy issues. Cause even by episode <laughs> 10 of lost, we, yeah. it was like very clear what that show was about, you know? So, uh, so, you know, like, I think honestly, if I had to say that there was any one contribution that I got to make to the show, that was like the most um, salient, it was probably pushing that point and, and pushing it through the course of the storytelling because even Madra Farah and Celadon and Madra Farah, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the all Madra and, and Celadon and Brea, um, you know, like they had drama, but it was very clear that the mother was doing the best she thought of for those kids, you know, and, and that was deeply important to me, you know, and, and, and also, you know, just the stuff with Orden and with, um, and Rianne and how that, you know, sort of relationship played out and how Orden wound up believing him. You know, like like a lot of that stuff, I really, for all the darkness in the show, I wanted the show to say that, you know, good familial relationships are possible. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. through adversity, especially yes, exactly. through adversity. Exactly. And it's interesting that you, uh, that you bring up the trial by air sort of sequence and also then later s cycling back to the idea of the, the flying unit for the battle sequence because... Uh, we were just having a conversation where we're doing a deep dive into Celadon's character. And we talk about how the ultimate moment of her redemption really is the fact that she fights side by side with Farah in the sky, which is when they were originally they were originally supposed to be fighting that way, each other in the sky. And then ultimately they end up side by side that way. So it's a really beautiful circle. Yeah, that must have been, I think that must've been a Jeff and Will contribution. Um, I don't remember um, that being in my, you know, when I when, when we were putting that together, I think it, it came in later, but look, I think Celadon, Celadon's probably my favorite character in the show. And and I know that's not a popular uh, uh, point. Oh, more than you think. Yeah, a character you love to hate or hate to love or, but yeah, it's just, or just love to love, like yeah. There's this. lots of debate. <laughs> Very spicy. I love, all, I love all of them. I love all of those characters, and and and. But there's a place in my heart for Celadon. I think Louis was very wise to push us on this character of Celadon. You know, we were all like Celadon. Eh, it's just, it's just gonna be mean, and then she leave. And and Louis was the one who sort of pushed for Celadon to be more of a character and to give her that arc. And we, you know, we developed the character all of us together. You know, with the other writers and and everything. And, uh, and she just, she just, it's such a rich character and she's so conflicted and she so goes the wrong way. But I think that, you know, I think we've all had the experience where everything goes to shit and you're just standing there among all this rubble going, I did everything right, <laughs> you know? And I remember the, 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 the sheer cruelty. And I don't remember who came up with the scene where the Skeksy stripper of, 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 of the, uh, of, of, I don't know where it, where in the breaking, who was the, the, the fountainhead for that. Um, but I remember that when we came up with it, we were uncomfortable with it. And then we read it in the room with the, and they and we were all uncomfortable. And then they were doing it on set and everybody was like, this is not cool. And it's such an affecting sequence because it is a moment of such awful cruelty. And you realize that as bad as you might've thought Celadon was, she really was trying to do everything right by the code that she had been taught. And she was trying to be true to somebody you know, and and I I I can't even think of the scene with the pyre without getting misty. It's 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 so touching to me, you know. So yeah, yeah I just, I love that character, and that scene is one of the most emotional scenes in the whole in the whole show. Um, yeah, you know, I think for me, um, I mean, oh God, it's like I can't even begin to tell you all the moments I cried during that show, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> having worked on it, seeing it even now. And that's, and that's what is so, I mean, look, I don't Norma Desmond, my other shows I've worked on like this, like I'm not watching episodes of like Helix or the hundred and weeping, you know? Um, I mean, they're fine. They're great. Shows. Well, some of them are, I don't even want to get into it, but anyway, you know, but this is the one that like, I still watch it and I get involved with it as a viewer. Um, because the experience of making it was so great and because I'm, I am so emotionally attached to them because I think the drama really works. And Cel Celadon in that way is is a really touching character, you know? And and so important to give a lesson in redemption and in humanity and forgiveness and empathy. Yeah, when she uh, uh, when she and, uh, uh, and, and Brea meet again, I mean, it's, it's everything. It's just so, you know, every, everything about the way that they came back together as sisters was really important to me and very touching, I thought. Very, very important and um, a message that I think uh, we can all agree needs to fall on um, more ears nowadays and um, very, very valuable. And look, which I think and which I think is important within families, you know, I think even outside of the greater scope of the health of our society, you know, I think I think that forgiveness and, uh, you know, renewal of trust and being able to move past even difficulties as egregious as that one, the ones that, that those sisters had, it's really important, you know, and I think especially where family is concerned, you know? So, yeah. 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 I'll tell you, I'll tell you the one thing that I was saddest to lose in the entire show. Okay. And, and, uh -huh. and, and it was not the action sequence on top of the crystal skimmer, which kicked ass. Um, <laughs> you know, just because the crystal skimmer was, they were going to be on their way to the circle of part of the, the, Part of what episode six, and I'll tell you about the thing I miss most, but part of the, the thing about that episode was that we really wanted it to be the episode where our team started really working together because they hadn't been together. They only been, they only got together on episode four. And then, you know, um, so, so uh, on episode five actually is when the team finally comes together. So, really, yeah. so, so we really wanted to show how, you know, Rianne and Deet and Brea and Lore and, and just all of them begin to like to, to work together. So, what was going to happen was that the crystal skimmer got darkened oh. and there was a whole thing that happened in it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and I mean, it's like it, the, what we wrote was unshootable, <laughs> but, but, you know, again, it was something that, that, um, but the thing I missed, so I missed that a lot because that was very cool. But one of the great sayings in Hollywood is the audience doesn't know what you didn't show them. Right. So I can tell you that and your imagination goes to all sorts of places, but I could also tell you about, you know, how the end of Return of the Jedi was going to take place in the lava planet and the ghosts of Obi-Wan and Yoda were going to come back and help, you know, uh, and help Luke defeat Palpatine. And that sounds like a really cool ending, too. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. But there was one point when there, uh, Margaret Dunlap, I had worked with Margaret on The Middleman, which is a show that I that I created a while back. And, and we were sort of, uh, you know, working on her episode. And there's this moment that we created where... Um, they're in the cave. They finally have escaped from, from the Skeksis prison. They're going through the cave system under the castle. And it's this area with all these stalactites and stalagmites, you know, and, and uh, the, the, you know, the Skeksis show up and now we're cornered and we don't have any weapons and all that. And Madra Farah was going to grab a stalactite, like a sword and wield it in the air and shout for Thraw, <laughs> you know, and that little moment is actually the thing I miss most that we didn't get to put on screen. Um, because it, you know, I always thought Madra Farah was such a badass, and I adored the character. I loved That's writing her. Um, I say some place, some, I'm pretty much every interview I've given, I say that I wrote her like Maximus and Gladiator. That's, you know, that's how I perceive that character. And, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, so to have her just grab a chunk of rock from and <laughs> wield it like a, but, you know, that's a hard thing for a puppet to do, apparently. <laughs> And and like even like with, with things that could have been um, like I remember I think when I read the um, the making of the Age of Resistance and I think even with, I think with the ascendancy the spiders that I think the original concepts were going to be like like the faces were pretty much going to be formed for with spider webs and sort of had that sort of well so sort of remind me a little bit of the juice juice mac machina from um, Matrix Revolutions um, so yeah, yeah yeah very much so. Um, you know, I think I think we've seen a lot of that sort of the the, the Deus in, in the Matrix certainly an influence. Uh, look at the, the, also the Borg. I mean, clearly, and you know, like I, I'm also obsessed with bees, so the whole hive thing is part of that. Um, I mean, look, everything you do is a is a collage of your influences, you know. Um, and with there are did Will and Jeff tell you about the two pop culture jokes in the whole thing? I don't think so. But if I if I had to guess, I know one of them was a Blade Runner, 
Tears of Rain? No. Okay. Um, oh, Rick Rick here. Yeah, uh, yeah Rick here. Yeah, which is um, uh, uh, Riker from Star Trek. Yeah. Like, if only that- we could have had had him get into a chair in the classic Riker way, but that's it'd be hard for a puppet to, to sling his leg yeah. over the back of a chair. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So. And the other one was the Ascendancy, which is a, a, a tribute to uh, the Chiss Ascendancy in the Star Wars novels, the Timothy Zahn books. I met Timothy Zahn at Comic-Con and I rushed to him to tell him and he looked at me like, what the hell are you? <laughs> so, but, uh, amazing. yeah, so, um, no, but look, I think with the Ascendancy, the, the way it turned out was not dissimilar to what I would have hoped when we, you know, when we put it on the page. I think that, look, I think with anything, and I'm a big fan, like, you know, my whole childhood is reading Cinefax magazine and looking at making up books. And I mean, my shelf is still full of them. When you look at like, I was reading my daughter a book uh, that it's illust- a Star Wars storybook uh, two nights ago that's entirely illustrated with um, with Ralph McQuarrie's original paintings, right? And uh, and it's great, but you know, my daughter, she's, she's five and she hasn't seen the movies yet, but she's been reading books about Star Wars. And it's like the Dark Crystal, I can't show her the movies, but we've read all the storybooks, all the kids' books and all of that, right? And she loves the Dark Crystal. Like she, she can recite to you the names of all the mystics and their counterparts, like without, she's amazing. Um, well she's done. just like her dad. <laughs> and, um, I mean, literally, literally every, every night at dinner for six months, we just take out the Brian Froud book and be like, that's the collector. And so, you know, but, but by the way, when the Age of Resistance book came out and there was like the, the, the general, you know, and the hunter, which weren't in the original Brian in the world of the Dark Crystal, that, you know, and so did the collector, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. especially because there's a collector in the Marvel universe. And that was, you know, but I was showing her this book illustrated with the Ralph McQuarrie drawings and she already has a functioning knowledge of the Star Wars universe. So seeing all of those drawings of what things were supposed to look like, you know, like when C-3PO looked like the robot from Metropolis, right? It just blew her mind. And I think that when you look at the the making of books, you see a lot of, a lot of different people's different ideas of, of what things might've looked like. And it's ultimately what was possible with the budget, with the time that we, that we had and all of that. So you know, it's um, so yeah. I'm I'm sure that there were a lot of concepts for it, and I'm sure that somebody was heartbroken someplace that the ascendancy didn't look exactly like what they might have hoped. I only saw it once; it was a, a beginning to be rendered in CGI, and you know, I was thrilled. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that is that so many people in the fan threads and everything always talk about how oh, that's clearly a callback to Labyrinth. That's clearly like a reference to the the hand puppets and when she falls down the thing and that they're all the faces with the hands. And I mean, you can see the connection, but Star Wars, that's I like that. <laughs> Just it, it, for me, look, and, and I remember that from Labyrinth and I remember it being really interesting because it's the helping hands and they're doing lots. So it probably also came from that. Um, you know, I mean, look, I'm working at the Jim Henson company. It probably had something to do with Labyrinth. <laughs> yeah. But to add in that extra flavor of, you know, the Chiss from the Star Wars novels, it's that's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it's like, look, Zahn is writing. Oh, my God. Like, I don't know. I'm sorry to nerd out about another franchise, but like I literally just no. about two weeks ago read the, the, the new Thrawn book that Timothy Zahn wrote about like that's just about the internecine politics of the Chiss. It was like, Andy, I was so excited about that. I'm like, the Empire, isn't it? And it's just about the Chiss and how they deal with each other. Ooh, you know, I'm a nerd. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's phenomenal right there with you. He is really phenomenal. I guess I would love to know, like, you know, you know, coming up with all these stories for 10 episodes, was there any sort of wildly hot debates that you sort of, you know, could, you know, whether you, some, you know, like a topic within the Dark Crystal that sort of discussed it, you know, just really at length, um, whether it was anything to do with the show or Dark Crystal in general, yeah. <laughs> a strange thing that we talked about, which has actually been addressed canonically now, is um, how do they make leather and are they carnivorous? And if you look at the Dark Crystal Bestiary, uh, which is a phenomenal book, um, we have two co- we have two copies of that one in the Dark Crystal, the world of the Dark Crystal in my house, because one of them is for my daughter and one of them is for me. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, she's five, you know, the book's going to get... Yeah. Um, is that so you find out that the podlings do eat nebries, but the podlings only eat the nebries after they've died of natural causes. Aww. And then that's how they also get leather because honor dictates that they must use every part of the nebri. <laughs> wow. So there were a lot of conversations about are they vegetarians? Are they vegans? Do gelfling, what did the gelfling eat? 
where do they get their leather? Like it was getting into the, like we were getting into the reads of really, really nerdy, like inside baseball stuff like that, you know? So I was actually very, we, we never got into it in the, um, in the, uh, in, in the, in, in, into the show, but I'm glad that somebody, you know, writing the bestiary sort of came up with it. So, um, but it was the, the big, I mean, you know, um, there was an argu- argument, not an argument, a spirited conversation about whether the Gelfling are asexual or not. How do the Gelfling give birth? Do the Gelfling have, you know, secondary sexual characteristics? And that was, you know, where Joe Lee came in with, with the Brian Froud book and said, look, here's a picture of them with a Gelfling maquette. And it has a, you know, and we're like, oh dear, we're not doing that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah! <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think it was the biggest debates were not necessarily about where the story was going although we had many of those, but the biggest debates and the most passionate ones were about things that were secondary to the story, but which affected the story, you know? Um, yeah. You know, so if you're, so, so, you know, if, if some of our characters are to have children and, you know, does that tie into the original movie? And if that's the case, then how did they have these kids? How did, how were the children born? You know, things like that, um, like became, you know, great topics. How does Agra, uh, mate with an asteroid in order to give birth to Rownip, you know. Yeah. However that's she wants. Uh, well, yeah, however, yeah, I don't even. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't want to watch that YouTube video. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's, <laughs> it's probably age restricted. I don't want to know, yeah. but I mean, but you have to have these conversations because you know, like, if you're gonna look at that character and maybe consider whether that character enters into this world or not or what have you, that's you know, these are these are these are conversations you have to have. Um, you know, what do they eat? How do they make leather? <laughs> do they, do they have sex? How do they give birth? You know, because those things actually affect, you know, another big conversation that, that, that we had that it sort of, you know, led to the invention of the armor legs was like, how do the Skeksis carriages move? You know, mm-hmm. um, things like that, you know, the, and, and, and those things also have to do with production value. And I think the armor legs are probably my favorite creatures in the whole, in the whole show. Like, I mean, there's a lot I love, obviously, but I mean, I love the armor legs. They were so like, Roly poly and weird and kind of resigned yeah. their fate, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah. But just a lot of a lot of what I call the sort of technology of your world building that is necessary for you to know to tell the story well, but the audience doesn't have to know anything about it. It's just something you need to know to tell your story, you know. So yeah. And I was just trying to think of one of the things I know. I mean, with Joe, I mean, I know of course with, with his books how they sort of went in a bit of different trajectory to you know what happened with Age of Resistance. And I think one of the things was you know whether you know oh well you know Tavris doing this and this and this and that, and it's like oh no, but Tavris a spider. <laughs> there was a lot of you can't do that. Tavris a spider now. You know what we what we did. I'll tell you my head canon of it, and you know, like look, we had a loose agreement on the show that as long as the novels and the comics and everything could shake hands, you know, not directly contradict each other, we were okay. And a lot of what Joey had to do was kind of, you know, do these contortions to kind of see how we could make them shake hands. And we feel pretty confident that ultimately we did. um, And we didn't betray anything, you know, although some things you might read the novels and go, well, that's, wait a minute, how, you know, you have to kind of headcanon it for yourself, but if you try hard enough, you'll get there because we made sure that that gap was there. Um, for me, I just think of the entire world. Look, Thra is not a standardized mechanical world. You know, for example, like the Scroll Keeper, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the Scroll Keeper writes lies in his scrolls, right? But his mystic counterpart, whose name I, I think it's the Chanter, uh, is it the Chanter? I think the Ch- I can't remember right now, but you know, who also like, mm-hmm. like that, 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 uh, um, you know, his job is to sort of write down histories, you know, so it's the difference between writing down the truth and writing down history, you know? So my guess, I think the scribe, that's right. You rack the scribe. Yes. Um, So, so, you know, like, like, so, so, so there are real sort of differences between how different factions of that world have captured their history. For me, this is not the official story. Right. How I reckon it is that many different factions had a lot to say about what happened in Thra. The Gelfling had a full culture. Some of them were chronicling it. Then they were all killed um, and there were only a couple left. So, you know, the Wall of Prophecy says one thing, a bunch of things say a thing, you know. So I just figured that you're not reading a story that's being told by the same narrators all the time. You're reading a story that different people have different ideas about what happened, you know, and you sort of look at all of it. And as long as it all sort of makes sense, it's OK, um, because yeah. Thra is not a perfect world. And I think the history of Thra is much like the history of humanity. It's not 
recorded necessarily by the most accurate of chroniclers all the time. Yeah. And uh, actually, I just it just reminds me back in episode one, I know how people said about the narration at the start, how it's like, well, the Skeksis gave, you know, the Olga of the Observatory, but it's like, oh, we know, but we know it's the Earth Skeks, but it's like, but, you know, it's like, oh, the unreliability, but also it's like, well, it's a certain point of view because they were Earth Skeks, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> also, also kind of the point that <laughs> yeah. there's all different storytellers and this we're- is the version as the Gelfling knew it, which wasn't necessarily true at the time, so... Yes, but also like that entire prologue was just designed to like bring the normals into the world, you know, like, I mean, honestly, it was totally. not. So like, do you really want to be there and go, look, the Erskek gave Augur the crystal and gave her the Ari, but then trying to purify themselves, they split into two sentient races and then they broke the crystal. Huh? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> so, I mean, look, I, part of me yeah. wonders whether, you know, we needed that prologue or not. It was very controversial, um, you know, and, and part of it of me wonders, well, do we, you know, should we have just thrown the audience in or not? But ultimately, you know, I think the prologue turned out very well. We got Sigourney Weaver to do it. Yeah. It's my second favorite thing Sigourney Weaver has done as a voiceover. Um, Space mom. I'm sorry? She's, we call her Space Mom in this house. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to say my first favorite thing Sigourney Weaver has done as a voiceover is Finding Dory. Have you guys seen? Yeah, that? Well, that was the oh best. Yes, God. yeah. My, that's <laughs> my favorite movie told me that. that year. <laughs> I, you have no idea how happy it makes me that you brought that up because I do not think Finding Dory got half as much love as it should have. Zootopia took all the credit that year, and like nobody was talking about Finding Dory, and I was just like, that movie made me cry like a bludgeoned Girl Scout. It was amazing. I got to say both of them, you know, and look, as the father of a five-year-old, I'm seeing a lot of this material now. And there is nothing better than a movie pitched to my daughter that works for me. Not necessarily because there's a bunch of anachronistic jokes that I remember from, you know, because I'm 50 and I'm Gen X, which is, you know, to me, like, I I really dislike the Shrek movies because I found that they were just all based on pop culture references, you know, some for the parents, some for the kids. But that was the only point of engagement with those movies. Whereas, you know, a movie, again, like Zootopia or, or Finding Dory, like they work as dramatic narratives of their own right. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, being able to, to, to share those with my daughter uh, has made a big difference in how I approach and tell stories because, you know, uh, it, 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 it really makes the case for, it doesn't matter who it's for, it has to work on all cylinders, you know? Yeah. You're not alienating any part of your audience in that way. Will actually, uh, Will Matthews talked about the the tone of the writer's room as sort of a marriage of professionalism and nerd joy. Actually, he specifically said that was the energy that you brought uh, onto the table when you came in. I have asked, I think, everybody that we've uh, spoken to about specifically that relationship between your inner nerd and your inner fanboy and then the part of you that knows what you have to do to get the job done to be a good professional. And from what it sounds like, based on everything you've said so far, your take on it seems to be that your sort of nerd joy helps to fuel the professionalism because it it sort of adds a flavor to it that enhances the experience. Am I interpreting that correctly, or would you say there's there's no, more to that? Guys are big nerds on their own volition. Don't you know? Don't think that I was the only one bringing that energy in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no no no! We they're all nerdy. We know. <laughs> it was it was it was one of those things where um, look, I knew what my job was, you know, and my job was to to to, to help um, set up a script pipeline that functioned properly and make sure that we made our deadlines and make sure that we had a schedule and that we presented deadlines to the studio and to Netflix that we could make. So that's my job. That's what I do, pretty much in any show that I go to, you know. Um, and and if I'm not creating the timeline that I'm obeying the timeline. So this is all very academic, like I said, sort of spade and trowel work of being a TV writer. And ideally when you're around long enough and you learn the job in and out and you have the kind of facility with that, that I have at this point after, you know, decades in it, um, you just bring that everywhere you go. You know, it's like, we make deadlines, we write the scripts on time. We, you know, we, we get them to the, to the production on time. We, one of the things about making television and especially when you've got, it's like, even though we weren't shooting while we were writing, um, we were still, um, we still had huge time constraints on us because the creature shop was building the puppets concurrently with our devising of the show, right? Because those puppets are incredibly labor intensive to make. I'm sure you've heard nothing about that. Um, and incredibly expensive. So you know, and, and they were making, and like, we literally had to, you know, stagger the filming 
the blocks of filming to make sure that, you know, some puppets couldn't show up until a certain time because they were still being made and the timetable. So we needed to give um, production and the creature shop and set design and everybody as much time as possible to know the story so that they could build the stuff we needed or tell us what they could and couldn't build. So, you know, that's part of the professionalism of it. So, you know, when you're writing a TV show, it's not just about sitting in a garret and putting down the song of your soul for the universe to appreciate your genius, you know? You're there because people need to know what you have to tell them <laughs> so that they can do their job. So that's just, that is the job. Um, so all the nerd joy, you know, it's, it's a great sort of thing that helps us all be excited and want to do the job. Um, but the job is clear and, and, you know, look, our job isn't mystical. You know, creativity can have a kind of mystical angle to it, but the job of a TV writer is come in, break story, bang out outlines, write scripts, get them to production so they can build stuff. Um, and that, and, and, and once you approach it that way, it seems like a very kind of technical and non-feeling way of doing it, but knowing the parameters of that is what helps your creativity be unleashed because it gives you a sandbox to play in. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a big part of it. I did want to, but before we wrap up, cycle back to you mentioned your your role as a mentor has been a great um, part of your career uh, in recent years. Your role as a teacher and the fact that you share so much of what you've learned from the industry um, via you know your scholarships, the numerous essays you've released, you know where you just deep dive into everything that you've learned. Um, I guess to connect it to what we're all here for at the at the Dark Crystal podcast. Do you see yourself in the future taking what you've learned from this specific experience with Age of Resistance, with joining the world of Thra, and utilizing that as a, a new layer of your of what you teach and what you put out for anyone out there who wants to get involved as a young writer entering the world of of film and TV specifically maybe for young audiences or in puppetry or in animation is there are there new lessons to be had now based on what you've learned from Age of Resistance it's yes and it's this um I think that Age of Resistance above all things for me was a clinic in surrendering your ego mm -hmm. which I think is one of the most important things you can do as a creator I think you have to have a certain amount of ego in that you believe that what you have to say matters and needs to be spoken. But at the same time, I also believe that there were a lot of people who had a great deal of power in the dark crystal, um, much more than I did. Um, you know, the, the, the real sort of, the four sort of sites of management and power in there where, you know, you, obviously you've got Netflix, but you know, you've got the creature shop, they're, they're their own entity. They've got their own thing going. They do things a certain way. You know, and then you've got the frouds, you know, they're their own axis. They have their own way of doing things and the way that they, you know, create. And then you've got the Jim Henson company, which has its own sort of way of doing things. Then you've got Louis, who is a very powerful, amazing film director, you know, and then you've got the writer's room. So, you know, even though, you know, the, the Louis was the person who was the, the head of this thing, there was a great deal of diplomacy that had to go on and not because we didn't get along but just because of what it takes to collaborate with all of these different entities doing work that is so complicated so i came into this job knowing that i wasn't going to be the boss and you know not to mention that as i said we were told in no uncertain terms you know you're the current custodians of this garden but this is a legacy and getting into that mindset where you're coming in saying my job is not to insist on myself it is to help this amazing thing go to the next level um, was a huge learning opportunity for me because it really drove home the idea that if you're secure in who you are and what you're doing you don't have to fight to be heard or seen it's going to happen because that's where you are and, and and you are where you need to be and you know like i said the show was really complicated there were a lot of struggles um and, you know, a lot of them are just the, the struggles against the two things that are the biggest, the biggest hills to climb in making anything, which is time and money. Do you have enough time to shoot it? Do you have enough money to build it? You know, that, that was our common enemy for all of us. And that's what, you know, so, so that usually is what brought us together, but it's also the creative. And, and I think that in all things, I just came in knowing that this was going to be 
as far as I was concerned, Will and Jeff had written the pilot. They were going to be, you know, the creative leaders of this thing. And I was there to help them and to give whatever assistance was necessary. And it was such a delight to have to be met with the kind of gratitude that, that they, you know, showed me. And, but also to just be able to come in and know that I could check my ego at the door and we would all be protecting each other um, was a huge part of it. And I think we can all do with letting our ego go. Once you've entered a writer's room, everybody knows you've earned your right to be there and that you have to have enough talent to have gotten there. So when, you know, your ego should come out through your ideas, it should come out through the, you know, how well you pitch, it should come out through how you convince people of things and all of that. It shouldn't come out with just insisting that you be prime in some way when you don't have the entitlement to. And losing that for the amount of time that I did for this has changed everything uh, for me and how I do business and how I work in other rooms. And I've been in a couple of other shows since I worked on Blood and Treasure, then I did Cowboy Bebop, and then I, you know, went back to Bebop for, you know, for, for, to, to, to write another, another set of scripts for it. So, you know, it, it, it just, it, it, it's become very useful to know that some things aren't yours and it's okay. And you can find satisfaction in the not, not being yours. Um, yeah. And that's huge to me. So, yeah, it's it it a life changing experience. I mean, it's, there's no two ways about it. This is the best. <laughs> it actually working on the dark crystal made me a better person. So think about that, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I have an Emmy trophy, uh, which the moment that my parents get vaccinated, I'm giving to them. They have the one from Lost too. I don't, I don't want that in my house because I don't need the <laughs> um, But I have an Emmy trophy where my name is right below Jim Henson's name. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't get much better than that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, of course, when you read the parts of the best children's program and you go, did you see the show? <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank no, no. <laughs> section, yeah. I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. <laughs> And of course, like, you know, I mean, before we wrap up, I mean, I was just trying to think of questions and I think one of the questions, I mean, we know how it starts, you know, with age resistance, we know how it ends <laughs> with the dark crystal and you think, oh, how does it end with age resistance? But it's like, but how does it middle? <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, you know, we know that, you know, hopefully down the track, you know, whether that story does get told down the track, that's, you know, we, we all got our fingers crossed and yeah, so. Yeah. We have, we have our version. That yeah, we yeah. Tell, and unfortunately we didn't get to make because of, of mm. a bunch of different reasons. But of course, yeah. I know what it is. Yeah. And I'm really happy with it because we worked really hard on it and it is poignant and touching and wonderful and not hopeless. Um, there is a strong chance that somebody else will come in and tell their own version of that story or that they'll look, we got paid you know, like there's a credit at the end of the of the show where you see it's you know with with acknowledgement to the work of a bunch of people who had worked on the Dark Crystal, you know, Simon and Rich had had created the hunter, you know, like, like there's, there's a lot of people who came into the show beforehand who had contributed material to different other versions of the project. Back, back when they were doing the, um, it was sort of considered being like an animation 2d show, um, back in the very early days. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, so, so, so it's like, um, maybe somebody down the line will get the pages that we wrote and adapt them in some way and put their own spin on them. And if they do, I hope so. Um, mm. and I'll tell you, I'll tell you four words that I hope to see if I ever see these words on screen, in a dark crystal related project, I'll be, I'll, I'll just be able to do this. If you ever hear the words, eye of the stars, that's all I'll say. Ooh, okay. <laughs> so. Eye of the stars, okay. Nice, all right. Perfect. Yeah, I already gave you the circle of the suns, right? So there's gotta be, there's gotta be a. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, yes, yeah. Counterpart, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. But now we need a third one. Everything's in threes. Yeah, I don't yeah. have that, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't give you any right, more. Well, get, into that. Uh, get on it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> basically, you know, what we're getting at. Hurry up. <laughs> uh, this has been uh, fantabulous, Javi. Cannot thank you enough uh, for joining us and for sharing little tidbits of wisdom and gigantic tidbits of wisdom, um, making me wish that either you or Louis would adopt me, you know. Thank you. You know, you guys uh, came into our radar early on and uh, we're just grateful that that you are out there holding the torch for this material because, you know, it's like it's it's ultimately people like you who keep these properties alive. You know, we come, we do our thing and then we go move on to other things. But it's the fans who love us 
and yeah. not us, like personally, but you know, who love the show and love the <laughs> thing we do. And you know, without you, this thing doesn't survive 37 years and still remain part of the popular culture. So thank you guys so much. And yeah, no, thank you so much, Harvey. Yeah, it means yeah, a lot. Yeah, it definitely means, means a lot. So and, very um, much. Yeah, yeah. And over the years, just, yeah, just, you know, being able to, you know, have these interviews with, you know, with yourself and, and Louie and Jeff and Will and, and ha Hayley Sanford and so many of the puppeteers and everyone who's worked on the show um, oh, has okay. been amazing. And um, yeah, we, we keep doing it and, you know, we still love in the show, um, you know, so no, we really thank you. And thank you so much for your time for being on Trial by Stone. All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you later. Yeah, no worries. All right. Bye. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. -bye.